So this is a 64-year-old female with history of hepatitis C and cirrhosis. She also has a history of hepatocellular carcinoma. During uh, workup of her ACC, uh, a splenic aneurysm measuring approximately 1.8 centimeters was discovered. She has since then had two treatments of transarterial chemoembolization for her hepatocellular carcinoma, both via a left radial artery access. Next slide. You see her past medical and surgical history here. She has AFib, asthma. She's had an ASD repair in the past. She doesn't smoke or drink. Next slide. She's on these medications listed here. No allergies, no pertinent physical findings or lab work. Next slide. This is a CT image um, demonstrating the splenic aneurysm is partially calcified, as you can see, and it's quite sizable compared to her aorta. Next slide. This is a MIP reconstruction. Uh, from that CT data, and you can see it, the splenic aneurysm is actually at the hilum with multiple vessels originating from the aneurysm itself. Next slide. And this is actually an angiogram from one of the chemoembolizations, which demonstrates the aneurysm nicely here with, again, at the hilum with multiple vessels um, originating from the aneurysm itself. Next slide. So prior to the procedure, we performed a Barbeau test, and this is um, an app for the iPhone. It's a pulse oximeter, portable one, and she has Barbeau A, which is um, quite suitable for radial access. I know a lot of people have different approaches for how they do this, but uh, just to zoom out a little bit, we have the arm positioned on the side. We're using a towel as a rest. I've already accessed the left radial artery using a glide sheath slender. Uh, and the reason we chose a slender for this case is because we're not, we're probably going to use a five French diagnostic catheter, but we want to have the option to be able to use a six French guide catheter if need be. Um, we position the arm to the, to the side as close to the patient as possible. And we've given, uh, we've given our standard cocktail, which is uh, 3,000 units of heparin, 200 micrograms of nitroglycerin, and two and a half milligrams of verapamil. So to, to specifically address the clinical indication, uh, we, we work in a, a very, very busy liver transplant center here in New York City. As a result of the large liver transplant program here, we see a number of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma that arrive here at the institution that want to be evaluated for a liver transplant in an attempt to cure their primary liver cancer. As soon as they're able to be stabilized, as soon as we feel like we have control over their liver cancer and they're being thoroughly evaluated for liver transplantation, our surgical colleagues in the transplantation group would prefer to have the splenic aneurysm treated prior to proceeding to liver transplantation. When we go down below the diaphragm, we typically, in almost every case actually, we go from the left side. The distance to the visceral vessels is actually significantly less. We should actually show now that the seroradial catheter is actually hubbed at the site of the uh, left radial sheath, just to give you an idea of the length that we're dealing with. And to echo Aaron's point, I don't think that we would have such a good seed in the splenic artery here if we were to approach this patient using a, a, a right radial access. Uh, so that's really the major reason why we go from the left. The other secondary reason, and I think this is actually important, is we don't have to cross the great vessels when we come down the arch as compared to a coronary procedure where we're going into the ascending area. Uh, we're coming down the opposite side. So we don't like to cross the carotids if we don't have to, especially if it's a long case. Uh, so we're really only crossing one cerebral vessel, the left vertebral. Let me back up and just tell you what we did so far. We, we took a, the seroradial and we parked it in the celiac artery to do a celiac angiogram. And then I used a uh, glide wire advantage, which has a soft floppy tip, but on the back end, it's actually very supportive. Sarah radial does have a little bit of a ledge. And so we do realize that that's definitely a risk of dissection. I don't know if you noticed, but I gave, uh, I gave a little bit of nitroglycerin to prevent some spasm. Uh, I wouldn't have done that particular technique in somebody that has a small splenic artery. In this particular case, her splenic artery is nice size. It doesn't have a lot of turns to it. And then what we do at that point, which is what we just did here, is we advanced a microcatheter. Uh, this is a 150 centimeter Terumo uh, prograde catheter that's 2.8 French. And you can see the microcatheter tip is actually in the aneurysm right now. And so we're going to basically complete the case using the microcatheter. Okay, so what we have here 
is the first coil. This is a framing coil. So uh, this is a Terumo uh, Azure coil. It is non-fibered. And this is really to frame the aneurysm. The size of this particular coil is 20 by 50. And as, you're, as you see it going through the microcatheter here, uh, it's going to create somewhat of a cage for the rest of our coils. Uh, this is what we would typically do as the first coil. Uh, it gives us a lot of support. Now, some people, and in some situations, we would coil the outflow first and not the aneurysm sac like we're doing here. But in this particular patient, there's actually three outflow vessels. So we decided that um, the case would probably be much safer to actually just coil the aneurysm and leave the outflows. What, what, what you'll see is that if, if, if we, we can show the screen simultaneously, this coil is attached to this pusher wire. And as I retract my hand, I'm actually able to retract the coil. This coil is still attached to the pusher wire. Be, it maybe I don't like the way that the coil has been de deployed in the aneurysm. This is, this is very, very elegant technology. And it, it really dramatically improves the safety of a complex intervention like this. And again, I can reintroduce it into the patient and allow it to form whatever shape I want. And it's only until I'm absolutely comfortable with the configuration of the coil that I can detach it. And there's a, uh, there's a, a handle that allows it to be detached. This is the, 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 the handle. It's an electrolytic process. And hopefully we can capture this on, on, on camera. But essentially, the back end of the coil is able to be introduced into the handle here. I hope you see there's a light there. And then I'm going to essentially activate. And you saw those lights blink. And what that confirms to me is that I've detached the pusher wire from the coil. And now again, as we go back onto the, uh, the, the, the simultaneous screens, I'm going to retract my pusher wire. Like and what you'll coil. see is that the coil is not coming back. The next coil that we're using is a smaller coil. This coil is actually an Azure CX coil, and this is a coated coil. It actually has a gel substance on the outside, which actually promotes thrombosis. Um, and so we're going to push that through. This is actually a very helpful coil to have in people who are actually on anticoagulation because it doesn't rely on the clotting cascade to th thrombose the, the vessel. And so as you, as you see what I'm doing here, I'm actually pushing this coil with the pusher wire. And once I actually get into the sac, I'm sort of just filling in the gaps where the framing coil uh, created the scaffold. So if we embolize this and the, t and the two or three outflow vessels, you would expect that the antegrade flow to the spleen would significantly decrease. But what ultimately happens is that the collaterals will supply the parenchyma. Collaterals being the gastric arteries, short gastric, gastroepiploic, uh, they all collateralize the spleen. So even though we embolize the proximal or mid splenic artery, we don't have any infarction of the spleen in most cases. So we're going to stop when our coils start pushing out into the inflow artery. And so really what we want to do is we want to fill the entire sac. And then as you can see here, you're, we're starting to push ourselves out of the sac and into the proximal segment. So what we're going to do in that situation is fill as much as we can. And you can see how Rob actually redeployed that coil. He didn't like where it was, he pulled it back, and he got the rest of it into the aneurysm sac. So we're trying to really densely pack this so it has very little flow. She is on Coumadin, so we want to try to really keep this packed very tight that it will thrombose. And so if you look closely at this image, we see that we've actually preserved the entire flow to the spleen. There's an inferior branch going to the lower pole. There's a mid-pole branch. And there's, I think you can even see the third branch there coming off the top of the aneurysm sac. And so you know, this is sort of what we're going to try to decide now. Are we done, or should we continue to embolize? Um, what do you think, Rob? I think we should inject the seroradial and see if we're getting preferential flow through the splenic artery or preferential flow through the collaterals. This is a hand injection with a 3cc syringe. So not the best angiogram. But we do see the splenic parenchyma. We see sort of what we saw injecting the microcatheter. If you look at this last coil that we're deploying here, it's forming a nice dense plug. And really what ultimately will help thrombose this is the, is the inflow plug. And so one or two more coils here, I think, is going to be exactly what, what we need. Um, if we see a little bit more stasis of flow in the proximal vessel, I think I'll be happy enough to stop. But as you can see, we're pretty good at what we have right now for this particular case. I think we're okay here. 
Um, so I think, I think this is one of those cases where we just need to be very patient. I, I think we've, we've created enough of a, of a dense uh, coil packing here. We're probably going to wait another 10 or 15 minutes and uh, see that the flow redistributes within this patient's splenic artery and will, and will likely from both. So I think it's going to be highly unlikely we're going to need to place more coils. Uh, and I, I think here patience is going to be of a virtue. Uh, and will allow us to uh, lead to uh, complete exclusion of the splenic artery aneurysm. And our protocol for, for closing the vessel is a standard TR band protocol. Uh, and our, we've actually looked at our experience with the liver uh, specifically, and our radio artery occlusion rate is somewhere on the order of 2%. It's, it's, uh, we're presenting this data at our national meeting this year, uh, but our occlusion rate is actually very low, and I think a lot of that has to do with as you all know, meticulous technique on access and also closing.